Good evening and welcome to the Stroud Mansion and to another great episode uh, in our third Thursday lecture series. Uh, tonight we have um, Kim Williams with us, uh, a very, very fine gentleman, a lifetime resident of Monroe County, a graduate of East Stroudsburg University, uh, a veteran of the Pennsylvania Army National Guard, a very, very fine photographer, and a, uh, and a wonderful local historian. And tonight, Kim is going to talk to us uh, about a little railroad uh, that was uh, re often referred to as the Dinky. Now, if going for a ride on a dinky doesn't make you smile, I, I don't know what's going to make you smile. Anyway, uh, please welcome Kim Williams. Thank you. Thanks, John. Uh, I hope I don't sound like I'm reading, but if I don't follow a script, then I'll forget something. <laughs> or uh, worse yet, go off on a tangent and possibly talk until the weekend. The Delightful Dinky is a program about Delaware Valley Railway, which, starting in 1901, provided conveyance between East Stroudsburg and Bushkill, a distance of almost 12 miles. We here in the Poconos, however, do not have a monopoly on the word dinky. There were, and still are, many dinkies worldwide. A dinky is any short train with a short route. More about the route of the local dinky later. A thorough telling of the DVR story should stress a very strong relationship with Delaware, Lackawanna, and Western Railroad, but also emphasize that they were two separate companies not even subsidiaries. In 1913, DL&W's superintendent, E.M. Rhine, scoffed at the rumor that his company would take over DVR, describing such an idea as Bosch. This was less than two years after the death of DVR's successful president for eight years, Milton Yetter. In 1856, DL&W, between Hoboken and Buffalo, became the first east-west railroad through Monroe County. For almost a century, transport by rail was the preferred option for almost any kind of cargo, human or otherwise, and Buffalo was a connecting point for many rail lines leading farther west. But it was decades later until even parts of a north-south railroad were reality locally. Delaware Valley Railroad was part of that north-south dream, which was to construct a 52-mile long line from the Lehigh and New England Railroad near Windgap to connect with Erie Railroad in Port Jervis, New York. It wasn't until 1888 when the southernmost five miles of the north-south route began operations to sail over. This 1938 map, 36 map, shows the Pennsylvania part of the Lehigh and New England system in red, although by that time its Sailorsburg branch was near abandonment after almost a decade of very little use. And the green sections, northeast and southwest of DVR, were then a faded dream. Now I'm going to, there we go, uh, try to master the technology that needs to be mastered to make this a a smooth program. Uh, in the 1890s, grading occurred between East Stroudsburg and Bushkill, and on August 22nd, 1901, it was front page news when rails could be ridden from East Stroudsburg to Coolbaz 
Middle Smithfield Township. Later that year, the route was completed to Shoemakers. At this point, some delay occurred because of the toppling over of a 20-ton beam for the two-span bridge across Bushkill Creek, north of Shoemakers, described in a newspaper report as an annoying mishap. But finally, on January 18, 1902, the terminus became Bushkill, 11.87 miles so far. The plan was that construction would resume in spring toward Port Jervis. But that and the stretch from Sailorsburg to East Stroudsburg were never built, only surveyed, and not much grading. Half of the requirement for dinky status was therefore met, a short route. More than 93% of DVR's right-of-way was on land negotiated with 38 property owners to whom the railroad paid a total of between $11,000 and $12,000 to use strips that were between 30 and 60 feet wide. Some owners cooperated for as little as a dollar, but some held out for as much as $2,000. Besides cash, a couple of landowners insisted that stations be built on their property, which was occasionally promised as a means to gain access to the land just to survey it. But once tracks were laid, the railroad might never get around to building a station there. Here's an example of Delaware Valley Railway being of insatiable interest to the local press. This article in the Strasbourg Times worries about where a gang of 150 Italian construction workers will stay while finishing the route. Michael McGrath from Massachusetts was the gang's boss. Communication must have not been a problem between the Irish boss and his Italian workers. For many years, in the early 1900s, DLNW's passenger department marketed itself annually, or almost annually, by publishing facts about mountain and lake resorts along the Lackawanna, which included mentioning destination service by DVR. Some of those staying places will be shown later using info from the 1909 and 1910 editions. For a shorter time, DVR marketed itself with a brochure entitled The Colonial Route. During its almost three decades of passenger service, DVR timetables were added to and subtracted from such that over the years, 14 different stopping places were listed, as few as eight in late June 1903, and as many as 12 just three months later. And this is in the short space between East Stroudsburg and Bushkill. The words stopping places are used because at certain locations there may not have been any structures at all, or a lean-to at best. Stopping was often simply to accommodate guest houses along the way that were a short walk from the stop. Also, the dinghy served as transport for locals going to and from East Stroudsburg when unpaved Route 167, which is now Route 209, was sometimes a muddy or icy mess. Before the days of school buses, students could ride the train to places offering higher education. And usually, the Learning Center paid for the trips. This picture shows my maternal grandmother and her family who benefited as both passengers 
and as operators of the Locust Farm boarding house at the Cool Bars stop. Time for some vodka, just a minute. At the beginning of operations in 1901, DBR's corporate name was Delaware Valley Railroad. But divisiveness among investors in 1903 resulted in a sale of the company by Sheriff Vincent Merwine, after which it was named Delaware Valley Railway. I think we need another sip of vodka. <clears throat> or a cough. Get rid of the frog in the throat. <laughs> so we have the sheriff's sale at which Milton Yetter became president of DBR when he bought it for $80,000. Yetter was a prominent local businessman who in 1877 had co-founded East Stroudsburg Glass Company and later East Stroudsburg Presbyterian Church. In 1889, he was East Stroudsburg National Bank's first president and was later a trustee of East Stroudsburg Normal School, now ESU. You'll hear about Yetter's private life later, thanks to investigative reporters of the day. First time riders on DVR might have thought that they were getting onto a top notch railroad because of the impressiveness of the transfer point at DLNW's East Stroudsburg station. But DVR actually rented space in that station and began the southwestern end of its journey on almost a mile of track, also rented from DLNW for $1,200 a year. But there was an obvious tip-off at the East Stroudsburg station that something was unusual about DVR. The head end of a Delaware Valley train bound for Bushkill was backward, tender first, then the steam engine. That's because there was no turntable or track configuration known as a Y to enable the engine to turn 180 degrees at both East Stroudsburg and Bushkill. Therefore, it was DVR's choice that the propulsion back to Bushkill and run around the train on a siding that was only eight cars long, hence the short length of any DVR train which meets the second criterion for dinky status. The previous pictures of East Stroudsburg Station showed it in its original location, across the tracks from where it is now. In, 19, uh, in 2009, the station was almost destroyed by fire and the wrecking ball, but in 2010, it was moved and restored by preservationists and philanthropists and currently the Eastburg Community Alliance manages it. The railroad tower in East Stroudsburg is also well preserved and has a DVR connection. Pulling the tower's lever 28 helped with signaling and therefore movement onto and off of. DVR tracks. ESRRtower.org is a website with much information about the tower, including its history, visitation and membership possibilities, and a calendar of events. Geez, I just realized I have their hat on, don't I? <laughs> uh, just west of North Portland Street is where DVR veered northeast onto its own tracks. The next 10 miles of DVR's route would surely have been noticeable for travelers used to a first-class railroad. 
because of the jostling from frequent starts and stops and always slow speed and incessant swaying on the lighter 80 pounds per yard rails. Located here at the Veer was the appropriately named Delaware Valley Junction Station on land that belonged to Oscar Stemple, a right-of-way grantor who required that a station be built along the tracks there. It was the nearest stop to East Stroudsburg High School and DVR's main office was also in the rather plain building. Now after the curve, the route straightened out onto what is now Oak Street, where DVR had an engine house and it's still standing. Inside, minor repairs could be performed and DVR's lone engine could be stored for brief periods. The engine house was later made three cinder blocks taller to accommodate its rebuilt next to last tenant. Major repairs were performed by DL&W workers at their gravel place facility, reached by staying on DL&W tracks for a couple of miles west of Delaware Valley Junction. This was another service that DL&W would bill for in addition to charging if DVR needed to temporarily rent a steam engine from DL&W. The photo on the right shows DVR engineer George Madison standing next to rented equipment number 492 with the engine house faintly visible on the extreme left. Other loaners known to have been rented from DL&W were number 222 and 456. Next towards Bushkill, for a short period in the early years of DVR, was the Eagle Valley stop at Route 447. This was the scene of DVR's second and final human fatality involving Teamster M.C. Strunk, a delivery man for A.J. Zacharias's Brick and Lumber Supply Company. Strunk died after his horse-drawn wagon collided with a DVR engine at about 7.30 on the morning of Saturday, March 9th, 1918. There was likely no building or at most a crude shelter at Eagle Valley, as well as at the stop at Craig's Meadow, located next to St. Paul's Lutheran Church. Guest houses, advertised as in the Craig's Meadow area, were the Bonnie Mead Farmhouse, Mountain Breeze Cottages, the Liberty House, and Waterfront Farm, which is now a Smithfield Township Park. In addition to the engine house in East Stroudsburg, one other substantial DVR structure that remains is the Marshalls Creek Station along Route 402 between its intersections with Creek Road and Route 209 behind the 1860 Saloon and Grill which is formerly Huffman's store. On the left is a fairly recent photo of the station and on the right is a pre-1915 painting of Marshalls Creek Station by artist Edwin Mock. In about 1910, Melvin Huffman was Marshalls Creek Station agent. 35 years after the closing of the railroad, the station was repaired after it was run into by a truck, which went off the road while going around a curve south on Route 402 at Creek Road. The Marshalls Creek Station, built in 1902 by George Peters of Shoemakers, was listed as catering to visitors at Highland Retreat, Tannenbaum Farm, Sunset House, Titania House, 
and Marshall Falls House, later known as the Village Inn. An interesting photo dated 1922 looks north on Route 402 toward where there was a mill before it was today's firehouse. The photographer's back was toward Route 209. Visible is a railroad crosswalk in the center of the picture. To the left, beyond the porch of the store, was the station. And to the right of the crosswalk, that's DVR's through truss bridge across Pond Creek. A couple of hundred yards closer to Bushkill, this photo shows just how close DVR's tracks were to Lake Marshall's eastern shore opposite Mountain Lake House, which did not advertise in the DLNW brochures of 1909 or 1910. The scene of the first human fatality, I emphasize that, you'll understand why later, the first human fatality to mar the safety record of DVR was slightly farther northeast on September 17, 1902, 67-year-old section worker Edward Millity of Scranton died after he fell from a rapidly moving hand car. Now closer to Bushkill was the Oak Grove stop, bearing the name of the large guest house less than 200 yards from the track. Any railroad structure here was believed to have been nothing substantial. No pictures of it, nor the next two stations were found. The Oak Grove House advertised a capacity of 125 in 1910. Between Oak Grove House and the next stop, Frutchies, DVR crossed Milford Road a second time since East Stroudsburg very near to where there is a Wendy's today. The Frutchie Station was on the east side of Route 209 along Frutchie Drive and accommodated the Hillside House, room for 40, which was separated from the tracks by a small ridge. Also near this stop were the Overfield House and Brightside Farm, two 1909 versions of Airbnbs, which could each take in 20 to 25 boarders. John Kintner and family staffed the Frutchie station. Kintner worked his way up DVR's managerial ladder, eventually becoming superintendent. While Kintner was a conductor in April 1907, he decided to halt a train so that unruly passenger Milton Yock could be put off the train. As the train pulled away, Yock threw rocks at the train and was later put in jail. Another stop that was not on all DVR timetables was Delaware Valley, not to be confused with Delaware Valley Junction which was nearer East Stroudsburg. Delaware Valley Station is described on 1926 highway plans as an old rail car. This map was drawn before Route 209 was relocated to the west side of the hotel, but after the name of the hotel was changed. Delaware Valley Station was named for the nearby Delaware Valley Hotel, which later became Regina Hotel at Hollow Road and Route 209. In 1932, the U.S. Coast Guard installed a benchmark in the foundation of the Delaware Valley stopping place. DVR's next stop toward Bushkill was Cool Bogs 
at Keystone Road, in addition to guests patronizing the boarding house of my great-grandparents, most of DBR's customers in the area were visiting the Rockland House or Rabbi David Davidson's summer camp for boys, while the boys' relatives and other guests could stay at Coolbaugh College Inn. Farther northeast was the Echo Lake Station, financed by the Reverend Dr. C. E. Van Allen, proprietor of the Echo Lake House. Seen faintly in the background across a field and across Route 209. A.F. Braun was a manager for Dr. Van Allen, as well as Echo Lake station agent for DVR. Echo Lake is a nearby natural landform. Here are four closer up looks at Echo Lake House, memorable because of being situated among maple trees lining Route 209, planted by Dr. Van Allen, but removed decades ago when Route 209 was widened. 75 boarders could stay at Echo Lake House for between seven and $12 a week. Very near to the scene that's on this postcard is where Delaware Valley Railway once again crossed to the west side of Route 209 between Echo Lake and Turn Villa Station. Shown is Fawn Cabin Restaurant. It's ironic that part of the restaurant is a modification of one of DVR's old coaches. Today, the business there is known as White Oak Tavern. Descended from Pub 570, Steak and Rib Inn, and before that, Petties. The Turn Villa Station is another example of a landowner, in this case Melchior de Pew Turn, insisting that DVR build a station on his property as partial payment for a right of way being granted. His guest house, a short distance east of the station, was also named. Villa. Here are some additional views of Turn Villa, which could accommodate 60, and was previously known as the Ridgeview House, and later as Echo Lake Farms. The railroad wanted to build an embankment for the tracks to be on, and Turn required that an underpass be cut in the fill so that visitors at his guest house could walk beneath the rails to the pond and to Echo Lake beyond. I explored this area in 2010 to find that the embankment, the cut, the pond beyond, and the steps up to the station were all still there. Next stop toward Bushkill was Shoemakers, another site that pictures of were not able to be found. Formerly, it was reported to have been a shed in East Stroudsburg for DL and W carpenters. This was a stop near Locust Grove, Decker's Cottage, DeWitt's Winona Falls House, and Overfield's Winona House. Beyond Shoemakers, DVR crossed Bushkill Creek and was now in Pike County. Before the end of the line was a short-lived stop identified on some tithing tables as Maples, which was the name of the 25 capacity boarding house that the railroad passed next to. If you squint real hard, you might see a path up to the tracks on the extreme right of this picture. Bush Hill Station was DVR's northeast terminus, rebuilt with cinder blocks in 1910 because a newly acquired passenger car was wider than its predecessor 
and it couldn't squeeze past the original station's wooden platform. That's the wooden station on the left and the cinder block station in another Edwin Mott sketch on the right. Here are four more images of the station at Bushkill where Norman Gallat was station agent before he became superintendent when Kintner quit. The pictures on the left show the wooden station. The post-1910 cinder block station is in the photos on the right. The dinky was also known as the Bushkill Flyer as stated on one of the postcards. Many resorts in the Bushkill area housed guests who had come from Philadelphia, Trenton, Wilmington, even Washington, D.C. They began their journeys as passengers on the Pennsylvania Railroad. Pensy could interchange cars with DL and W in Minunka Chunk, New Jersey, and with DVR in East Stroudsburg. Pensy also had an agreement to occasionally bring some of their own engines onto DL and W track, but only DVR engines and those occasional loaners from DL and W went onto DVR rails. So PRR could designate and did Bushkill cars in those distant cities and passengers in them could ride to Bushkill from afar without having to leave the car. The train in this photo before it left East Stroudsburg is at or near DVR's maximum length and appears to include four Pennsylvania Railroad coaches. The three largest Bushkill area resorts were Forest Park Inn and Cottages, capacity 330 in 1910. The Peters House could accommodate 75, and the Maple Grove Hotel advertised room for 50 orders. Lodging at several other places near Bushkill was also listed. The modest amount of incoming freight hauled by DVR included foodstuff for the kitchen at Forest Park Inn, and another Bushkill area customer was Peter's Coal Yard, located across Route 209 in back of the former Dutch Reformed Church. The remains of the coal yard are still visible. Cars filled with coal usually had doors in the floor. The cars would be back to top these concrete compartments. The doors would then open and out came the coal. Outbound freight customers of DVR included the nice lumber business in both Bushkill and Coolbaz, and ice shipping occurred from Lake Marshall a popular swimming spot. Beyond the swimmers, in the picture on the right, can be seen the chute that horses or mules pulled harnessed ice up to load into rail cars. There was a short siding in this area on which to store ice cars. Still evident is the cement foundation of the Bushkill station, and crumbling abutments can be seen next to Marshalls Creek, Pond Creek, Bushkill Creek, and not pictured, Little Bushkill. From the air, the most obvious view today of any portion of Delaware Valley's right-of-way is where it crossed a marshy area just northeast of Weary Lake in Middle Smithfield Township. That's Google's aerial view left and in map form on the right. Said earlier was that 
DVR had only one engine at a time. And in its 36 year history, it had a total of only six engines. DVR appropriately relabeled its first engine, number one. And it was shown in that front page newspaper photo. Number one helped with construction of DVR, but the engine was far from new. Before DL&W sold it to DVR, it was photographed when it was number 64, which it was for 23 years on DL&W's Morrison Essex branch in New Jersey. The name A. Reasoner appeared on it in honor of Andrew Reasoner, who was superintendent of the M&E branch for more than 20 years. Mentioning first engine justifies mentioning DVR's first engineer, who was Hiram Mann. Now, there's finally tangible evidence of DVR. Oh, the press then as now introduces speculative articles among the factual. Factual, yeah, DVR's three new cars were reported as handsome. But what about that stretch of the line from Salisbury? or to Port Jervis. In 1902, it was reported that mail to points between East Stroudsburg and Bushkill now goes by train, no longer by stagecoach. But then speculation followed regarding hauling milk, or will there be a spur to Forest Park, or a spur to a lumbering operation near Resica Falls? Another report was that DVR has ordered five freight cars and purchased a turntable for Bushkill. But maybe that turntable ended up in Yetter's garage because Yetter's son wrote about having seen a turntable in the garage that would reposition the family car. Okay, DVR's second engine displayed number four and was 19 years old when it was bought in 1903 from the Bangor and Portland Railway after number one had an injector problem the previous year and was sold back to DL and W. This photo shows number four shortly after it was built in the 1880s. The Bangor and Portland Railway, by the way, became part of the DL&W system in 1910. Number four was DVR's most photographed engine and served DVR longest during the company's most vibrant years into the 19-teens. DVR's third engine was number 20 seen here on the left in East Stroudsburg before backing to Bushkill. It and DVR's fourth engine on the right, number 23, also seen in DVR's typical backing to Bushkill pose, had been bought from New York, Susquehanna, and Western Railroad, which since 1882 had gone through Stroudsburg. Number 20 was scrapped in 1923, and number 23 was sold back to New York, Susquehanna, and Western after only three years of use by DVR. Notice that all of DVR's steam engines were of the 440 configuration, which refers to the number of leading wheels, drive wheels, and trailing wheels. DVR's trains were short, the route was short and level, therefore its steam engines could be small. The fifth engine, owned by DVR, 
was number 902, which was 44 years old when bought from DL&W. But it had been thoroughly rebuilt into a style of engine known as a Camelback. This photo shows number 902 on non-DVR rails. The outlook for its future in 1926 was about as rosy as DVRs. A couple of years before number 902 was scrapped in 1933, the engine was the subject of a painting by Bushkill artist John McPherson Sr. Number 902 was parked in 1928 after only two years of service to DVR and McPherson saw it rusting away in the Bushkill area. Inconsistent with its pattern of buying old engines, DVR's sixth and final acquisition in 1928 was a brand new piece of motive power. And its source of propulsion was gasoline, not steam. The unit was referred to by its manufacturer's number, 2861 assigned by the Plymouth Company in Ohio. It was also 1928 when DVR decided to become a freight-only railroad and ceased its passenger service, although for the next nine years very little freight was hauled either. Ironically, in 1932, DVR received a slight surge in revenue resulting from several shipments of material for improving Route 209. Those deliveries made the dinky even less used. Here's notice to DVR's final freight company in mid-1937 stating that deliveries of heating oil to Pennsylvania Independent Oil Company located in the 600 block of North Cortland Street, would be discontinued before October 1937, when the preferred method of transporting cargo, as well as people, had become by cars, buses, and trucks, then it had become time for DVR to cease railroading entirely. Number 2861 was in excellent condition in 1938, and it was quickly bought for service elsewhere, eventually ending up as number 92 on the roster of Landisville Railroad near Philadelphia, and used as recently as the 1990s. But the current belief is that number 28. 61 was later scrapped. As stated previously, Delaware Valley Railway and Milton Yetter were often written about by the local press between 1903 and 1911 when Yetter died at the age of 62. It has been suggested that this photo shows number four draped with black crepe memorializing Yetter. From his house at 80 Antelomic Street, East Stroudsburg, Yetter could see activity in the direction of the East Stroudsburg station, such as DVR's number 20 returning to town from Bushkill. DVR advertised the 35 minute ride between East Stroudsburg and Bushkill and during the best of times, the 70-minute round trip was scheduled five times a day. The Yetter House is seen in these photographs from 1897 and 2014. An alley in back of the home was named in Yetter's honor. 
other paparazzi tales about the misadventures along Route 209 focused on Yetter's interference in the elopement to Wilmington of his 32-year-old daughter, Myrtle, and her 35-year-old boyfriend, Elmer Stevens, chief dispatcher in Philadelphia for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Also news was Yetter's court appearance after being accused of poaching and the curtains catching fire in his house and his fishing expeditions. His other daughter, Minnie, suffered a broken leg when a bicyclist ran into her and the Bushkill station was burgled by someone who escaped on a bicycle. So you see how much fun it was to research DVR and Mr. Yetter? The following challenged my Photoshop abilities. In 1905, an article appeared regarding an infant bovine being transported in a crate in the rear baggage car of a typically short train. The calf was destined for a farm in the Bushkill area. But when the train arrived at the end of the line, it was discovered that the calf had kicked apart the crate that it was in and had escaped thanks to the car's open door, which added to the calf's comfort, so they left the door open. Where might that calf be? The train then backtracked eight miles until the critter was eventually found, unharmed by its jump from the train, contentedly grazing in a field in the Craig's Meadow area followed by lassoing, reloading, and returning the calf to Bushkill. The media's attraction to sensationalism and gore is nothing new, proved by this article, printed February 15, 1902, describing the first life, human or otherwise, lost on the new railroad. It was reported that Jack Cusers, $50 bird dog, died because of trying to get on a train at Bushkill. Winters were the least kind season to the dinky because of the weather and lack of tourists at, the, at that time. The most serious derailment of a DVR engine occurred in February 1910 when it would have slid much farther down an embankment had it not stayed attached to its one coach, which remained upright. But passenger service was not interrupted because until track repairs and a loaner could be obtained from DLW, DVR arranged for riders to be transported by sleigh. And less than two weeks later, the loner made an unscheduled second trip between East Stroudsburg and Marshalls Creek to transport an overflow crowd which had attended an annual church dinner. The venue was Marshalls Falls House, where almost two dozen diners had come by sleigh from Shawnee. Okay, this one requires another wet my whistle. Articles about DVR appeared nationally regarding Yetter's spat with a cleaning lady, Angeline Williams, who was washing windows inside a coach one day when the train began to move. She didn't want to jump from a moving train or wait at a stop and reboard the train when it was returning to East Stroudsburg. So she rode all the way to Bushkill and back. Now, this is not the coach 
that Angeline was washing windows in, Delaware Valley acquired this coach four years later. But back to the Angeline story. When she asked for her pay for window washing, Yetter was aware of what had happened, and he refused to pay her. He told Angeline that the round trip fare to Bushkill from East Stroudsburg was the same as what she was owed for washing the windows and, and were square. Well, Ms. Williams would not back down. She later obtained judgment and intended to force a sheriff's sale of the railroad in order to get her pay. And yet her, wanting to avoid the sale, then decides to pay Angeline the window washing sum of one dollar plus three cents interest. Angeline was not the only distaff objector to a DVR tactic. A common place to park the dinky while it was not in use was on a siding shown in red on this Sanborn insurance map south of East Broad Street between Lackawanna Avenue and DLNW's main line in East Stroudsburg. In the process of firing up the steam engine, a huge plume of exhaust would occur, complete with copious amounts of soot blown by the prevailing westerlies onto drying laundry hanging from the clotheslines of neighborhood washerwomen who, who were not happy. For alliterative effect, this program was entitled The Delightful Dinky. But some opinions describe DVR as far from delightful. A Philadelphia preacher, for example, wrote a letter to the editor of the Stroudsburg Times, summing up his round trip to Bushkill with the words, a more shocking old train would be hard to find. In 1926, investigators from the Interstate Commerce Commission, who had been tasked with assessing the value of DVR, issued a rather scathing report, which repeatedly included such phrases as inadequate or no available accounting records, necessary records are not obtainable, and cannot be ascertained from its books. Furthermore, the ICC charged that DVR had failed to meet an obligation to report to the agency annually for all of the years from 1908 through 1913. Well, maybe it's the passage of time that contributes to a mellowing of sentiment regarding Delaware Valley Railway. It's been said that imperfections are not uncommon in fairy tales, and in that respect, DVR was like a fairy tale, but it was real. This amateur photo is possibly the last documentation of the passage of the dinky. Those are the words used by the photographer's husband. The picture was snapped by an avid proponent of preserving Monroe County history. Maybe you remember the name Elizabeth Walters. Her backyard overlooked Eagle Valley, where in June 1938, Philadelphian Henry Rieger and crew had come from Bushkill a few days earlier, picking up DVR track along the way, using that gasoline engine, pulling a flat car, being loaded with rails. Horace Walters noted that it was like losing an old and respected friend. For a few decades though, DVR was vital to the area and for that reason, 
the memory of that old friend should not be lost. Speaking of not remembering, this is no doubt an incomplete list of sources that should be credited for providing images and script that you have just seen and heard. Didn't intend to forget any, but I'm sorry if I did. On the right is the cover of the most recent book about DVR. And among places that it's available, I believe, is here in the Historical Association's bookstore. Its author, Michelle Jacks, and I were separately researching DVR at about the same time, and I'm very grateful that she shared so much that she had collected, even info found after her book was published. So that's all for now, unless you have any questions. I'll, I'll put my glasses on so I can see raised hands. Okay, I'm over here. Good boy. <laughs> you have, you, no, I want to see the question asker. I don't want to see you, John. <laughs> oh, you do have a question. Sorry, you'll have to wait. <laughs> this train leaves East Strasburg and it goes to Bushville. Yeah, that's its only stop. No, no, it no. stopped at all those all places, those stores, Delaware Valley stopped. Junction and Eagle Valley. Right, okay. It stopped 12 to 14 places right, okay. between Bushville. That's an example of how stoppy and starty it was, right, right. how uh, those people used to a first class railroad must have quickly noticed that this wasn't first class. <laughs> Uh, it's swaying from side to side because the rails are lighter in weight than first class railroads. Yeah. So, yeah, it stopped 16, uh, maximum 14 places between here and Bush, uh, between Eastburg and Bushville. Okay. And I, I think you may have answered this, but how many, how many runs were there a day? Uh, Sometimes there was one a day, but at the best of times, there were as many as five a day. Right. And it was a 70 minute round trip, so uh, they were on the go for many hours. And I go back to the story about the uh, church dinner. Uh, that's an example of uh, what this Horace Walters would refer to as an old friend. You know, you just don't have that happen today. Oh, there's some people left back at the Marshalls Creek Station. There goes the train back to the station to pick them up. Uh, so they, it just seems like there are so many hotels. There are, they can accommodate so many people. How many people could you get on a date? Well, you figure maybe 70, 70 people a car. And if you have a maximum of eight cars, that's 500 no, people. No, I thought it only had four. It had four Pennsylvania railroad cars in that one picture, right. but it had three other uh, DVR cars of their own. They had three passenger cars, as well as the five freight cars uh, that maybe they did, maybe they didn't have. But. Uh, and I will say that one of those three cars was a combination baggage and smoker car. So it wasn't the full 70 complement that other cars might have had. But, uh, the, the, the reason that Uh, well, the, the reason that they didn't continue to build the railroad onto Port Jervis. Yeah, and also the 
grand plan was to have the railroad come up from Sailorsburg. So those two segments were never built. Why? Probably because nobody came up with the money. Uh, and it was a borderline wise investment to even do it in the first place. Uh, but they had, since the 1890s, so much grading done and uh, they'll at least build this segment between Eastburg and Bush Hill. But it wasn't long until, you know, the Industrial Revolution came in or the uh, gravitation to automobile and bus eventually airplane, truck, and... It wouldn't have lasted very long. Uh, I think the wise investor realized that come the spring of 1902 when the thought was maybe they'll begin uh, resume construction, but by then the investors thought better of it. Good, folks. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for coming, and uh, thank you, Kim. Always a pleasure to see Kim Williams. Thank you for coming. Thank you.